And the first speaker uh, uh, today is Dr. Uh, Peter Johnston. He's at present senior policy advisor of uh, uh, the European Policy Center in Brussels. And of course, he's an active member of the uh, Club of Rome and chairman of its uh, International Advisory Council. And by the way, also co-founder and ex-vice president of the uh, EU Brussels chapter. Uh, very important, of course, is that he was a chief coordinator of the European Commission on Sustainability and he headed the uh, task force on innovation. So, a very competent person to report uh, on sustainable development experiences and perspectives. Please, the floor is yours. It's an enormous pleasure to be here and to help uh, celebrate the, uh, uh, the honorary doctorate for Professor Rademacher. I, I, I've known him for many, many years, I, uh, and uh, we've often worked together. Um, you know, he has been one of the formative elements in the, uh, both strands of my experience in sustainable development. And I, I really talk to you about two different perspectives that I've lived through in, in 20 years. A perspective as a member of the Club of Rome, trying to pull together uh, the expertise and the knowledge from an enormously varied community of, uh, of people, industrialists, scientists, academics, um, from around the world. Um, a club that has regenerated itself over the years, um, still very much in the, um, the model of the work done in the 1970s that resulted in the, the publication on limits to growth. And, but then my other experience, alongside that, working in the European Commission, now in the European Policy Centre, trying to see how do you translate these broad ideas of sustainable development into practical policies that we can implement, that we can live with, and that we can see come to fruition. I'm going to show you some transparencies just to help us get an idea along the way that uh, we do live through multiple crises at the moment, but I, I'm an optimist. I, I really do think that these crises will help to show us the, the better way for the future. The, I suppose the crisis that you feel affects you most here in Greece is the, the aftermath of the financial crisis, 2008, 2009. Um, it test, we tested collectively the limits of debt fueled growth. Um, how much could we simply uh, mortgage our future? to support a lifestyle and a, a way of uh, managing our affairs that really wasn't going to be sustainable. And I suppose the first thing that I, I would wish to emphasize is that sustainable development means everything has to be sustainable. The financial system has to be sustainable. Our social systems have to be sustainable. It's not just an ecological sustainability. We are on the way, I believe we're on the way, to re-stabilizing the financial and the economic system. We've not done it yet, we're part of the way. Greece is not the only country that is suffering enormous trauma. Uh, many of the countries in Europe are uh, finding life is difficult to get back onto a, a more stable track. But we will get there. The, the bigger danger we have at the moment is that we've become so obsessed by the financial side of the crisis that we are losing track on some of the other big issues. And so far we have failed to engage the broader global political community on, on the, the, the mid and longer term dangers of climate change. So I'll say some more about that. We are making progress on reducing global poverty it's slow, but it's there. Uh, and I, again, I, I'm optimistic that the trend that we now see is one that we can sustain and that we can have 
much greater equity and equality and, and prosperity around the world. Uh, partly because we now understand much better what are the links between the social and the environmental and the economic sustainabilities. Now, when the, the Club of Rome published its report on limits to growth, I think very often this has been misunderstood, that there is some limit that we will hit uh, uh, a limit to growth beyond which growth will no longer be possible. That, that really cannot be true. We certainly will hit limits to how much we can pillage the environment to, to fund our growth. We will hit limits to how much we can uh, uh, fund growth simply through greater indebtedness. But we, we need growth. We need growth to restore uh, government finances. We need growth to restore employment, particularly in Europe. And the developing countries now need to sustain growth to meet the expectations of their younger populations. Uh, we cannot expect them to uh, now uh, look uh, longingly at the qualities of life that we enjoy uh, and give up any hope of having that themselves. But this growth has to be different in the future. It must be more equitable uh, and it must be more consistent with the financial uh, stability, an energy system that is sustainable, and climate security. My work, and I, perhaps I have to say by way of excuse that uh, I'm a physicist by training, uh, so I tend to look at these problems that we face as uh, systems to be analysed, um, to be modelled, uh, to be understood. Um, and one of the new changes that has come through in the 1990s, the late 1990s and the last decade, is to be able to look at all of our social and economic systems as complex networks. The internet really changed the game on this because until about 2000, we knew we lived in social networks, but we couldn't measure them. After the internet became one of the main mediums of social and economic networking, not only do we know we live in networks, but we can measure them, we can model them, and we can understand them. And these networks that we live in have been reinforced by communication technologies. These networks co-evolve with the environment. Um, we live in a, a connected world, it's a connected world where our social systems, our economic systems can be simulated now. We understand much better how they evolve and we, we can learn some valuable lessons from this. And first, that there is no single magic political bullet that can be fired to solve our problems. Everything is so interconnected if we want to re-stimulate growth, there is no single measure that will do it for us. You need a mix of measures. And in here, this is a simulation of investing more in innovation and research, investing more in the networking, more in education, more in liberalization of trade networks, um, faster environmental technology development. And if you do this combined package then you'll get growth. But any one of these things in isolation won't solve the problem. And the same on social equity. Um, again, you need a package of measures that complement each other, that work together, and the package will be that that uh, is then able to generate the sort of growth that we want in the future. And of course, we were able to translate these ideas into the legal and regulatory frameworks of the European Union. The, the single defining moment uh, was in 1999 when we, through the Amsterdam Treaty modification, introduced sustainable development as an overarching treaty obligation of the members of the European Union. And it's, it's still there, it's now Article 3 
of the Lisbon Treaty, and it will be there in 50 years' time, because if you embed an obligation like this at that level into the treaties that bind together the members of the European Union, then it will have to be reflected in all the different strands of policy making, in employment policy, in social policies, in, in, in taxation and trade policies, as well as in the innovation and the climate change policies. Innovation has always been crucially important. We will not achieve sustainable development simply with the technologies that we have today. We cannot simply do less and have sustainable development. We must do more, but we must do more with new technologies, new ways of doing things. And look where the motor of innovation still is. It's still driving the high-tech information technology communication revolution. And that permeates through everything now, through the internet, through the social networking phenomena, through the, uh, the trade networks that it's opened up, through the new opportunities for employment that it brings into every region of the world. Uh, so these innovations uh, are the solution for sustainable development. Um, the automotive sector still representing nearly a quarter fifth of the total investment in innovation, we are going to need mobility in the future. We can't have cars as we have them today, but we are going to have to have the mobility that we want. So we do need to have uh, tremendous innovation in the whole transport system in the future. And that's where the resources are still going. I said that uh, internet and the information technologies are key. They're particularly crucial in the energy system. We need smart grids, smart buildings, smart cities. It's not just that they provide a new communication channel. The information communication technologies in their core, in the microelectronics, they have spun off the new battery technologies because we needed the batteries for the mobile phones. That's the battery technology that will now drive the new generation of electronic vehicles. It's revolutionized lighting technologies. Um, the light emitting diode technology that came from um, optical communications for telecommunications. This is a 10 times more efficient as a way of providing light than our old incandescent bulbs. It will radically change the way we light buildings and streets and cities in the future. And renewable energies. Um, this is the spin-off from the same microelectronics technology. Um, it's a spin-off that has allowed us already to generate solar energy at three euros a watt in 2000, at one euro a watt in 2010. And my current projections are that by 2017, we will have grid parity. That will mean it will be as cheap for you to generate your solar power through solar panels on your own roofs as it will be to buy the power from the grid in a few years' time. And this will be a real tipping point because you will see then that anybody that has space, flat roofs on supermarkets, they will be covered in solar panels. Once it's cheaper to generate it there than it is to buy it from the grid. But this is not the end of the story. Uh, what we learnt in the IT revolution is that we can project ahead the learning curve for these technologies. And by 2030, solar energy will be one of the major sources of energy that we can rely on. And that, fortunately, we will need it. Um, I, I, fortunately, it will be there, because if I come back to the climate story, and it's somewhat out of fashion again now to worry about the climate, but the problem has not gone away. The problem is actually getting worse. We are well outside the stable range of the greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere. We have a new report from the working group of the International Panel on Climate Change a few weeks ago 
that largely reconfirms the science that they had presented before, um, but with some uh, new and harder facts behind it. Um, we are going to have to do something about it. You know, 40, 50 years ago, it needed a, a, a club like the Club of Rome to produce its assessments uh, of the dangers from um, an over material, uh, a, 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 a over use of materials. Um, we don't need the Club of Rome to do these assessments anymore because this is the OECD. This is the largest economic forecasting organization now in the world that can produce our assessments of how we're going to warm the climate if we continue with the use of fossil fuels as we have them, as we use them today. But it's not average surface temperature change that is the threat. Let's be clear that there are parameters that are used by climate scientists to understand the change in the climate. We, quite frankly, we wouldn't care if all that was going to happen was that the climate was going to warm by two degrees and ocean levels were going to rise by half a meter. We could live with that. We were an adaptable species. The danger is that this changes the nature of regional climates, regional weather patterns. This is data from um, Jim Hansen a year ago. Uh, and if you look at the top line of the distribution of weather patterns, uh, and it doesn't matter whether you do it in the US or Europe or around the world, they're all the same. Of course, the distribution shifts upwards. We've, we've increased the average temperature by about 0.8 of a degree. But what's dangerous about this and what will be very expensive about it is that the probability of the 100-year flood or the 100-year drought used to be 1 in 100. It's now 1 in 20. And it's going to get more and more probable. And the severity of the storms, Hurricane Sandy, the typhoon that's going through the Philippines now would not have been as strong if we hadn't warmed the atmosphere and warmed the surface waters of the oceans. And we, this is where we will have to find the right balance because this is going to cost an awful lot of money, whether it's on the insurance. If you look at the insurance claim profile, uh, or if you look at the numbers of people displaced by floods particularly, uh, or storms, this is where the economic cost of climate change is going to bite. So we are going to have to do something about it. We can do something about it. Um, and we can still get back onto the right track. Uh, I, I, I'm not at all a pessimist on this. We, we may still have a lot to do. But the Europe, in the European Union, we've shown a lot can be done. Um, but there are still what we call green pathways ahead of us, where we can still stay within uh, the range of climate stability that, that we need for the future. Initially, it's largely efficiency gains in the use of energy that will get us on those tracks. But new energies, the renewable energies, will play their part in the 2020, 2030. <coughs> but then we will have to almost certainly rebalance the carbon cycle. Um, we've allowed emissions to go so far now, and they have such a long, the, the carbon dioxide has such a long residence time in the atmosphere that uh, we, we will have to find a way of managing our climate within the next 50 years. Uh, and one of the ways that we can do it is simply to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and re-sequester it in the largest natural stores, the soils, the wetlands, the forests. So there, there are other things that can be done on both ends of the carbon cycle rather than just reducing fossil fuel use. And these trajectories, if, the, if you combine them with, again, the innovation 
trajectories. They do provide solutions. We do have a way forward. Um, this is a combination of combining a carbon pricing mechanism uh, with further networking innovations. And it makes an enormous difference to the carbon emissions uh, 20 or 30 years ahead. It makes an enormous difference to the levels of carbon dioxide that we'll have to live with in the atmosphere. So the future is not something that we simply have to live with. The future, we can steer. Uh, and we have the tools now to steer it. The tools, very briefly, and then I'll stop. We need to start accounting for our carbon emissions uh, right through the supply chain, measuring and recording carbon emissions and carbon sequestrations in agriculture. Um, we need to put in place the uh, infrastructures that we need to have this growth, this new green growth. We need to get carbon transparency for investors. And this is already well on track now. The Carbon Disclosure Project, which has been running now for a few years, now mobilizes most of the major companies in the world. Um, the protocols are in place for tracking carbon emissions, and the business community has put these together themselves. We need carbon transparency for consumers, you and I. Um, I don't know whether you know how much carbon it costs to come here. Um, these are not intuitive. How much does your weekly supermarket shop cost in terms of carbon emissions? There is no intuitive answer. We don't know this intuitively, and we need to know it. Um, and we can then have either personal carbon accounts, or we can insist that what we buy in the supermarket is already carbon neutral because the carbon <laughs> emissions have been offset. So the, the, the mechanisms are in place, uh, and we, we can move along to a much more optimistic uh, scenario for the future. And I, on that, uh, let me finish and let you listen to Professor.